Merry Christmas and good morning, Coach. Good morning. Good to be back with you. Absolutely. Always happy to have you uh, in the program. And tell you what, a big weekend coming up when it comes uh, to the college football playoff. Bama and Oklahoma, Clemson and Notre Dame, especially when it comes to Bama and Clemson, both places which you're very, very familiar with. So first off, uh, let's go down to South Florida, Bama and Oklahoma. Uh, two great offenses, two great quarterbacks, two great traditions. Just kind of give us your first thoughts of uh, at least the matchup down in South Florida in about 48 hours or so. Well, I guess the first thing everybody assumes is that Oklahoma is not going to be able to make enough defensive stops to have a chance to win this game. So, <clears throat> having seen them play very little, but lately, I, I would have to agree with that. Unless Alabama uh, you know, cuts off some of their own drives with mistakes or penalties or turnovers, uh, unforced errors, uh, I just don't see them being able to get enough possessions with the ball to score enough on Alabama. Oklahoma can score on anybody, and they will score on on, uh, Alabama, but they're going to have to have a lot of possessions to put up big points on Alabama, and I I just think Alabama's offense is going to be capable of eliminating that. Now, if Oklahoma can come up with three or four, just three or four huge offensive, excuse me, defensive plays and get an offensive takeaway, it it could be an equalizer, but I I just don't see them being able to do that for 60 minutes. So let's just assume then that Oklahoma – holds chalk as far as their defense and has issues stopping Tua or Jalen Hurts in the Alabama offense. That uh, How much pressure then does that put on Kyler Murray and that Oklahoma offense to have to go out there and basically score on every possession? It, it puts tremendous pressure. And, you know, they already play that style of football, so it's not like they've got to jump out of their skin if they do get behind. They're, they're a wide-open attack from, from the first snap. Uh, I just feel like it's going to be – definitely the best defensive team they've played yet. And uh, there, there will be some times where I just feel like they're not going to be able to convert some critical third downs. And I think his, I think his uh, scrambling ability, he's a tremendous athlete. He's been able to do it on everybody. But it's, it's not that he's not going to be able to do anything against Alabama. I just think his, his uh, uh, big plays are going to be limited. You mentioned about Kyler Murray's scrambling ability, but – uh, he's grown an awful lot since coming onto the collegiate mm-hmm. scene in Texas A&M to winning a Heisman Trophy this year. What also impresses you about Kyler Murray? I, you know, just the, the one time, a few times I've seen him on the interviews, uh, very impressive young man. He's very well-spoken. He seems to be real bright and intelligent. Uh, obviously, the football intelligence seems to be there on game film. Uh, but I just, you know, he's a very impressive young man. Of course, everybody's familiar with the fact that he's got a opportunity to go play pro baseball, already been drafted by an organization. So that alone tells you what a tremendous athlete he is. Uh, Having recruited a a couple of uh, dual sport guys in that sport, uh, baseball times uh, players uh, quite frequently time them on the length of the base path, which is, you know, uh, getting the first base. They want to see what their speed is out of the box. But some of those guys have some unbelievable 40 times and uh, he's he just a tremendous athlete and backs it up with the character and the intelligence factor and all of that. So he's a heck of a player. So you've had to game plan against a lot of quality quarterbacks. Peyton Manning, one of the first ones coming to mind as far as uh, growing up here in Tuscaloosa when uh, Peyton Manning was uh, throwing the darts up in Knoxville all across the SEC in college football uh, in the mid-'90s and many, many others that you certainly – uh, observed both on film and in live action on the field or in a press box. So uh, just kind of describe from a coaching perspective, what makes game planning against someone like Kyler Murray so challenging? It's very difficult. I, I think the probably the most uh, comparable would have been Johnny Manziel. And uh, Manziel was a little less predictable, a little more maybe jumping out of the scheme or the system and creating things on his own. Uh, Kyler seems to be more into the system, but then can get out of the system when things break down. But both of them, you know, present a tremendous mobility issue. They both can throw the ball accurately. They both have velocity on the ball. I, I would say that because of the system he's been playing in, that Kyler has a lot more uh, polish a little bit in his game. Uh, Manziel was a little more physical kid, I think. And uh, but he's a tough kid. But... Uh, you know, that, that would be who I compare him. I've coached against Michael Vick, Donovan McNabb, 
bunch of the guys that can run and throw. But those two seem to me to be a, a, a pretty similar. And they're in somewhat similar offensive systems, too. You just, you know, you finally get to the point, you say, well, we shouldn't be able to play man because he's going to pull the ball down and run it. Or we can't play zone all day because he's going to pick us apart. The bottom line is you just got to go out there and play a niche. And you've got to hope that they don't make as many plays. Uh, the time we beat Texas A&M, we had a great offense with a great running game. They were able to sustain a lot of possession and match every score. And we came up with about four critical turnovers, and that's the only way we beat him. So how in, how would you see how do you see then Nick Saban uh, and Tasha Poy and the Bama coaching coaching staff uh, game planning? What do you think they will try and do to at least contain someone like Kyler Murray? I, I don't think they'll change much. I think they'll emphasize some coaching points, and and that's why I say Alabama's got good enough players on defense. Oklahoma can score on anybody, but they're not going to. They haven't played a team as well, t- a talented as well, balanced and coached as Alabama. And I think that that uh, they'll have a few little coaching points where they ask defensive players, on the, say on the wide side of the field, don't be taking shots, making inside pass rush moves, and these type things. But I don't think they're going to have to come up with any special game plan in order to try to beat Oklahoma or contain Oklahoma. I think they've got to give him a variety of things and. And make the young man, you know, don't give him a steady diet of anything. Make him to play with his, his mind as well as his feet, his arm. Uh, I just think that Kyler's going to make a share of plays, but I think Alabama's going to limit him. So I've got, so I've thrown this question out, coaches. We're talking with Coach Ellis Johnson on the Bud Light Hotline, presented by Adams Beverages. I have this question for my audience out there as our question today, and I wanted to get just to kind of pick your brain. Uh, your coaching brain on this as far as game planning is concerned between Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray. Both have won Heisman trophies uh, the last two years, both at least with Kyler Murray after Saturday night will have played SEC opponents. So just from your years of experience applying this question to you, coach, who would you rather game plan against them, Kyler Murray or someone like Baker Mayfield? I think they're very similar. And I've never coached against Mayfield. You know, I've only seen him in games. And frankly, I didn't see very many of his college games. But uh, I think they're very similar. I've, I've seen Mayfield a little bit more like Manziel, uh, a little bit, a little bit quicker to pull the ball down and run it. Uh, maybe a little bit more physical. Uh, not sure, you know, about the passing accuracy, the velocity on the throws, the accuracy on the throws, the number of throws they can make. I'm really not. I don't think I'm a good enough judge of that from having not seen them very much. But I think they're very similar in what problems they present to a defense. And that's the ability to extend plays when they're not there and to turn an average play into a great play, the ability to beat you on third down with their feet. It just keeps you off balance. And that's why I say I don't think you can go into a ball game playing against these kind of guys and play with caution or play scared. I think you you get your one or two third down scrambles, so be it. You know, I think you're going to have to put up with some of that. I try to get as many hits on them as I can in the first half. Uh, you know, make them tired, whether it's hits in the pocket or hits on the running game or anything else. Try to get as much contact on them as you legally can. To try to wear them down a little bit. Well, Coach, you mentioned something about uh, Kyler basically going to make his plays during the game. It's just too good of an athlete. And Oklahoma scoring, getting their fair share of points. But when you, let's fast forward to after the game. What would you consider a successful defensive outing for Alabama? I, I assume that both teams play extremely well. I think if they can hold Oklahoma uh, 400 or under yards and take three turnovers off of them, maybe there's a few other factors in it, a couple of key red zone stops where they have to go for three instead of six. I think those would be the key things. I, I think if Alabama plays and, and, and the other team's got 400 yards, that's not a real, real big deal. I mean, they beat Georgia. Georgia went over 400. Uh, and they're, they're a very good offensive team. So anything that doesn't get out of hand and get up into 500 yards or something like that, they're going to have enough chances to get their turnovers and get their red zone stops. And there'll probably be a couple of third downs in there that Oklahoma's just not good enough to uh, convert. One thing we, we don't bring up enough, though, and I will say this, I, I, Oklahoma's got a great-looking offensive line. And they can get physical. So if Alabama's going to have to, instead of getting worried about Kyler every play, they really need to make sure Oklahoma doesn't generate a running game. And I think they'll be in a lot better shape. 
So tell us, how good then is this offensive line for Oklahoma? I, I compare them. I thought Texas A&M had a really good-looking offensive line. Uh, I think this is a, a, an offensive line that looks a little bit like the ones they had back when Stoops was there, and they had a couple, a couple of runs at the national championship. They're big and they're physical. And that when you've got offensive linemen like that, you can play a one-back and even a four-wide offense and still have some physicality in your running game. Now, that really puts pressure on the defense. So, you know, we can talk about Murray, and I think he's a great player, and I know he's going to make some great plays. But I think the thing Alabama's got to keep out of this ball game, they cannot let Oklahoma establish a running game. So first and second down then, especially first down is the key, for, at least you think, for Alabama's defense. Always will be. Yeah, it gets to play like that, man. And, of course, Murray can convert the third long. But still, I, I think it's important that you keep that from being a factor because it just – it could be something. I think Alabama also has to take uh, the factor away. When the game's over, they need to have a lot more possession time than Oklahoma. Both of them are capable of scoring on, on big shot plays, but I think the more Alabama controls the ball and, and uh, keeps it away from Oklahoma, it, it puts a lot of pressure on their offense. The only way I think Oklahoma can neutralize that is they're going to they're gonna have to try to run the football on, on Alabama. I think it's critical that they're not allowed to. We're talking with Coach Ellis Johnson on the Bud Light Hotline presented by Adams Beverages and going not too far from where you're at. Also, another uh, program you're familiar with when it comes to the Clemson Tigers, once again in the college football playoff, Coach. But uh, they, like Alabama, uh, will at least expecting not to have three players uh, with them for their Cotton Bowl game against Notre Dame, including Dexter Lawrence, one of the top uh, defensive tackles in the ACC and in the country, Coach, so how does, speaking of game plan, game planning, Coach, how does uh, Dabo Sweeney work around that with his Clemson Tigers on Saturday? I, I don't think it'll hurt him too badly. I'm not familiar with the two backup players and how many snaps they've gotten this year. Uh, Dexter Lawrence is a force inside. His backup player, uh, Albert, uh, Albert uh, I, I can't spit it out right now, but I both recruited and evaluated him and Dexter. As, as high school players, and Her- Albert Huggins, I'm sorry, from right here in Orangeburg, South Carolina. Huggins has probably got a little bit more tackles and stuff on the stat charts than, than Dexter, but he does not create the disruption and the, and the difficulties on the offensive line that Dexter does. But I don't think the key player in this is, is Huggins. I think it's whoever Huggins' backup is, because one thing that Clemson has – has done that has been tremendously tough on football teams this year. They have a two deep in that front. They've obviously got a bunch of so-called first rounders in the front line and their backups are going to be also first rounders in a couple of years. So what they're crushing people with is not only talent, they're getting them with depth too. Now they've lost some of that. Uh, Huggins can make just as many good plays as, as Trevor, but he can't play a sustained 60 minutes without a backup player. So, I think that's going to be the key. And I don't know who that player is. Maybe they play three guys, rotating them to play two positions. Uh, depends on how good a start they uh, get off too early. I don't know how good uh, Notre Dame's offensive line is. I've not seen Notre Dame play a single game this year. Uh, but I do think that uh, it, it will be a factor. But I don't think the problem is, is his backup player. I think it's whether they've got enough depth to give that player some time. So, Coach, we've seen – Clemson and Alabama, almost a yearly tradition in the playoffs at this point. Do we see part four of Alabama and Clemson when we talk next week? I, I would lean that way. But I will say this. I, I don't think that Clemson or Notre Dame have, have really been tested this year, week in and week out. Uh, I do think Clemson is a lot more explosive team than Notre Dame. But I'm not sure Notre Dame is not a little more balanced. Uh, not as many weak links in the kicking game and, and the secondary and other areas. Uh, they, they've, you know, they've got some balance in their offense. They've got a good solid kicking game. They've played pretty dang good on defense. They don't really have a weakness. On the other hand, they don't look real dazzling either. And I don't think either one of them played a very tough road. So that game's going to be interesting. Clemson's uh, got some players that can explode and put points on the on the board from any at any time from anywhere and. It's going to be tough for Notre Dame to, to hold them down. But that game could be a, a pretty big surprise to everybody. But right now, just like the, the gurus out in Las Vegas, 
you'd have to think that Alabama and Clemson probably have the highest percentage of medium again. I tell you what, they're pretty they're pretty good coach as far as those gurus uh, out in Las Vegas. But before we let you go, coach, uh, any other games as far as a uh, non playoff games uh, strike your interest for uh, this weekend? Not really. I, I think probably Auburn needs to, you know, they definitely need to have a good game. Uh, a lot of change going on on their staff and some other things with, you know, people are starting to look over and see if they're making progress in the right direction. Uh, not sure if there are any others that are very important, but I do think there's some, you know, the fans that may be listening to us right now, of course, I think they would care about that one. Uh, you know, South Carolina, obviously, I keep an eye on them, had some time, I worked with them. And uh, they're playing in Charlotte on Saturday. And, uh, that game's always been terrible weather. It looks like they're going to have a decent day. So hopefully they'll have a good finish. Uh, that'd be three, I think, three years in a row. Go to a bowl for Will. He's got him going in the right direction. They've got a ways to go. He came in at a time where Georgia and Clemson are all extremely strong. And, and that's tough recruiting in South Carolina when your next door neighbors are programs are in great shape, but he's closing up on them a little bit each, each time, I think. It won't be long before they be able to uh, compete evenly with them. But those would be the only ones I'm really keeping an eye on. And, uh, and of course, we'll see some other great ones over the over the, uh, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Absolutely. Coach, I believe the next time we talk to you will be 2019, the turning of a calendar. So, Coach, have a happy new year, and we'll talk to you next week. Same to you, James.